Um, so I wanted to chat to you guys about getting DeFi to scale today. There's a there's a critical uh, there's a critical tipping point that's super important in this space where we turn the focus away from the technology and towards adoption. And there's this blend that we need to create of perfection of where the technology's ready, but also the onboarding or the user experience is also simultaneously ready. And uh, as we all know in crypto, like there's plenty of problems that are holding us back from going to market and having billions of users tomorrow. But there's also simultaneously uh, plenty of opportunities right now. There's almost this perfect storm of the technology being ready. So I want to share with you today what we've kind of noticed and what our uh, theory is. Um, just real quick, uh, clicker. All right, so why do we even need DeFi in the first place? Uh, there's currently about 4.2 billion people who experience some sort of banking problems. And right now, uh, we, we're, right now we're in a country that actually has pretty good banking. Like Korea, South Korea, doesn't necessarily need DeFi that much because you guys have got pretty good services. Like you've got a really good closed network here of great financial products and services. However, there's like multiple countries where you can't, uh, there's, there's two and a half, three billion people who can't even buy like US equities or can't participate in the global financial system. So decentralized finance for me is all about access and really making it accessible for those uh, that can't get banking. Another great market for me that I think is important is like the 1.1 billion people who don't have ID and don't have a birth certificate, don't have a driver's license, so they can't register for a bank account in the first place. So for me, this is the critical reason for crypto is getting access to these financial services and products. Um, so wh why, why should you uh, engage in listening to me? I spent a lot of time training like mums and pops. So like bringing in uh, older generations, you can probably see here like the, uh, the average age here, there's a lot of bald patches of people sitting in my photos uh, learning from me. And basically what we did is we taught them how to download their first wallet, how to you know, install Exodus and go through the first steps. We give everyone in the audience like $5, and I got all of the first user questions at the very first entry point to crypto, all of the friction points. Like for example, I'll give you this great example. I'd stand there on stage and explain what private keys are and public keys. And then what would happen is I would say, download Exodus and then when we come back after the break, I'm gonna give every single one of you $5. And I did this to close to 10,000 people. And almost every single event, every single event, people would run up to me in the break and they would say, oh, can I just skip this step of writing down the private keys? Your end users that you guys are building for or building towards are used to a Web3 a web experience. They're used to name, email, next. And I was talking to a couple of different teams that have built crypto wallets, and they've had uh, bounce rates like 84% on the private seed phrase screen. So when you give your user the 12 or 24 words, this is where most apps are losing their users. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Like, when do you download an app? You download it when your friends tell you about it, or there's another time you download it, which is you've, got, you've made like a deep mold into the couch and you don't want to get up and get a piece of paper and pen to write it down. So most of the time, it is just like too much friction at the checkout. So there's, there's, there is that. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mosendo. Uh, I, was, I was teaching people how to use cryptocurrency as my primary effort before this, uh, but I had a lot of success in investing in early stage startups. Like I found angel investing uh, brought me a lot of capital very quickly. So I thought I'd go from angel investing to the startup side and uh, put all of my attention there on building something because I'd essentially done these user interviews with these, with these people that have been teaching about cryptocurrencies. So um, when will everyone use DeFi is an interesting question. How many of you right now actually have some money in some lending product or some sort of like Compound or Dharma or yeah, any of you have actually using any of the lending products right now? Maybe three, four, okay. Four people in the room. How many of you would like to, but you just haven't got around to it by a show of hands? Yes, a couple of you, okay. 
So the thing that I think that's really interesting about DeFi is most people uh, think that it's going to be like this revolution that's going to change the world. Uh, however, right now there's a lot of steps to get involved or to get started and there's too much friction. It's not usable right now. So what, what has to happen for everyone to be able to use DeFi is really we need to make the, the financial products that they're looking to use more usable than what they already have access to. So um, these are the five huge, huge problems with DeFi right now. Uh, it was identified in a question just before, but uh, getting people in, uh, you know, for right now for 30 confirmations on the Ethereum blockchain, you're looking at about seven and a half minutes to open up or start a new account or to start, start like a, a channel or any kind of things, even if you are using these second layer solutions. And then the other big problem is gas, like the cost of transactions to be able to, like if you're a high frequency trader, it'd be really cool to see when injective protocol go live on mainnet. Um, you need that gasless environment to be able to uh, send and receive transactions without it being uh, so ridiculously uh, expensive. So uh, there are solutions out there. We've heard of like Plasma, uh, there's state channels, and there's Lightning Networks. At Mercendo, we've, used, we've decided to use Connext, uh, which build uh, state channels. This is actually a little demo of us sending some DAI between two devices. Uh, so I've got the DAI over on this phone. I want to send it to this one. I hit Request on this phone, which allows me to you know, get the QR code scan up. Uh, scan it from this device to this device and in a moment what we're going to do is we're going to hit send um, and you'll get to see the transaction speed using the ch state channels. So we're going to send across five die and we're going to hit back on the screen so we can see it and so we'll hit send there, success and there it is, it's on the second device. So that's, you know, state channels can, can be collapsed down to uh, the Ethereum chain to be settled at any time, but ultimately transactions can happen fast now with state channels. And so we really decided to embrace that because people are creatures of convenience. And if we can't make things instant and fast, then, then this money can't be used at like a cash register. You can't wait seven minutes when you're buying a coffee to pay for something, it's too long and it's absurd. Um, but this makes it as fast as Visa or MasterCard and can handle uh, and scale quite beautifully. Uh, this is the other problem that I spoke to you about before is uh, the, these seed phrases, they really stop users from getting onboarded. They are, they're critical uh, for security presently, uh, but there is something new that's coming that's uh, pretty interesting. So this is how we're handling it. Uh, we're using uh, a few different things. So the way we're setting up our wallets is by setting up smart contract-based accounts, which enable us to resubmit private keys to the contract to control the wallet. So this gives us a fully non-custodial, decentralized way to do account recovery. Um, now, I'd explain, to this, explain this to you again in sort of a basic way, but basically I can sign up to get my wallet started and just put in name, email, and hit next. And if I have this wallet and I control it on a couple of devices at once, what that means is I can ultimately uh, recover my account. So if I recover my account on my mobile and I push to get recovery of my account, it's going to take three days to get that request. Now, this means if I got SIM jacked or something like that and someone stole my phone, and I still have access to my iPad and my computer where I have the Mosendo wallet, I can hit reject or decline the resetting of the keys or the control of the wallet. Does that make sense? Cool. So basically, this means we can do email and SMS recovery. And even if you did get SIM jacked, you've got this three-day window, so you're sweet and you can still control your funds. Uh, this obviously is a form of security that's designed for small transactions, fast payments, um, and designed to get, you know, really, it's starting to be used as everyday cash. Um, on that, uh, everyday cash is really quite difficult to use with crypto, as we know. Uh, it, you know, like if I wanted to save for a car in Bitcoin, uh, maybe if I, if I wanted a car next quarter, maybe I could buy two cars, or maybe I end up with a moped. But I don't know because I'm saving in a volatile asset. Uh, so 
it, it, whilst it might be really good if we save in Bitcoin and we save over the next two or three years, it might be a great savings vehicle for that. It's not in the short term. So we've obviously you know, seen the advent of stable cryptos uh, like DAI. How many of you know DAI? Yeah, cool. Um, DAI is probably my favorite stable cryptocurrency because of the uh, capital controls resistance and the ability to do cross-border payments where you couldn't normally do it. Uh, the DAI is, you know, is settled by a, and collateralized by Ethereum, which makes it you know, all locked up in a smart contract and it's not got any of the uh, hesitancies that I have with assets like Tether. Tether's perfectly fine for like fast transactions if we're going to send some money across the border and we need to do it once that's fine but you wouldn't want to hold your savings in a currency that say say for example someone was you know a high school student in iran was you know trying to learn about physics and he used some you know i don't know he tried to buy some uranium online some used uranium to put into a his science project tether is going to be shut down the bank accounts that control tether is going to be shut down by the u.s regulators in a heartbeat so whilst Tether is perfectly fine for single transactions, they, it's not usable for holding a stable asset base in, in, a, in a way that can't be shut down. Your asset's at risk because it's got the regulators in the way. So uh, I love that. Um, the fifth problem is this, sending addresses. How many of you remember any of your Ethereum addresses or Bitcoin addresses verbatim? Like if you, you, you don't, it's absurd the way the system is designed right now. Uh, you might remember the first few digits and the last few digits, but you couldn't recite it to anyone. You couldn't, like, for example, if I was running a, if I was running a telethon on TV and I was like, send money to this address, or if I was over the radio getting people to just submit donations, uh, it just doesn't make sense. So you need to be able to do things, uh, two things. You need to be able to do, uh, like, a money tag. So in Mosendo, we've got two ways of sending money. One, we could replace this with a MoTag, which would just be like dollar sign Roscoe. So you can just have like dollar sign your name. And this is a simple money tag that uh, replaces your public addresses. Or you can do something like this, which is uh, what we're really focused on, which is we've turned the actual link itself into money. So this is designed for small transactions again, but say we just went out to dinner and we had, you know, we shared a meal. We're not connected like deeply yet. We've just, you know, we've just hung out for the first time and I'm gonna send you some money for half the bill and we've connected on Facebook. I, I've just, you know, I've just met you. I don't wanna ask you for your bank account details to send you money. Like it's a bit like next level, right? But I can easily and effortlessly send you a link on any platform. So I could send this on Kakao Talk. I could send it online. I could send it on, you know, WeChat. This makes it so we can send the money through any medium. And what happens uh, when someone clicks this is it'll redeem in their browser, in their web browser. It'll redeem it and then it'll give an option on that screen to download the app to secure it or they can forward that money on to somewhere else also. So um, when will everyone get on board with this? I think the network effects of uh, things like money links and MoTags and those kind of things are gonna help us with adoption massively, especially if someone doesn't have to have ever used crypto before uh, is the important part. I think, I think when we're gonna get mass adoption in this space is when people stop trying to educate about cryptocurrency, stop trying to teach people about all the benefits and traits of it, and just start building real world products and services that are easier to use in everyday life than what they're already using. Because people aren't comparing uh, their financial products to cryptocurrency based on anything else other than is it going to work better for them than what they're already doing. So we need to think about it at that meta level. Um, you know, the, how many of you are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle in technology? This is very typical. Uh, in the 90s, we saw the likes of Blockbuster. Uh, you know, turned down purchasing this little old company called Netflix, like late 90s, early 2000s, um, because the internet would never scale to play video. And this is when you, you have the, the, the over elation of ideas, early phase of a, of, of a market, of a technology, and then the tech doesn't quite stack up. But what happens is typically on the way down to what they call the trough of disillusionment, that's when everything comes out. So if we think about this in terms of crypto, We've had, you know, 
Bitcoin beginning, Ethereum happening, you know, price rising, and then we've had, um, you know, gas and transactions taking way longer. I mean, this is a massive innovation. We've gone from three days to settle in the traditional banking system to seven minutes with Ethereum, but it's still too long for everyday transactions. And then we had expensive, expensive gas events. Does anyone, did anyone ever pay like more than $25 for a Bitcoin transaction? Yeah, in the peak of 2017, I remember sending a few transactions that were like $65. So we had like this mass elation at the same time as all of the problems of the network showing up and this, this, this you know, resets expectations. But now we have the exact opposite where we have everyone running for the hills because they're like, this thing is never going to work. I'm worried. Like, is it going to go back up? You know, the price is down. This is down. Oh, everyone's sad. Uh, this is actually the most exciting time to like reinvest, double down and, and, and get really excited about the space again because uh, when, when was the best time to buy in the dot-com boom and bust? Right after. Right after it busts because that's when you could have picked up Facebook and Amazon and Netflix and Google stocks at like epic prices. That's where you found the 10,000 X's. So I think it's a really interesting time and I think we've got to remind ourselves that technology does this. This is normal and we've learnt this all before. Um, and, and, and remember that it's way bigger than crypto. Like I know I'm standing right here in nonce and I, there's so many sayings on the wall about, you know, decentralization is the answer and all those sorts of things. It is, but when we like, you know, go out there and tell the world that decentralization is good and all these things are good, it's kind of like we're, we're kind of a little bit like a crossfitter or a vegan or a born again Christian in that moment that we're just like knocking on their doors, telling them our beliefs rather than focusing on just making their lives easier because that's what we're here to do is, is to make their lives easier. Let's make better products and services and things that actually make it easier for them to transact and do business rather than espousing like our whole like, you know, just our thoughts and feelings on them. So, uh, yeah, uh, we've, we've been sort of like as far as traction in Mosendo goes, uh, we're still like got an alpha testing sort of like environment. Um, I can show you some demo, some stuff if anyone wants to come up and show me. Uh, like I can show you the, the onboarding process and things that I've got on my phone. Uh, but yeah, like we're just like pre-launch, uh, we're ex anticipating like end of this year we'll open a beta testing group of 10,000 users with a small balance and then uh, early like Q2, Q3 next year we, we intend to open uh, up the product fully in the app stores. Uh, we have this really cool uh, Facebook group that we've been building called DeFi Nation. We have like all these interviews with all these founders uh, and we've been like basically like wherever we've been around the world this year, like whether it's in New York or Berlin or, you know, DevCon next week, we interview founders and we drop up projects in there as they happen in the DeFi space. So uh, it's called DeFi Nation is the, uh, it's, a, it's a Facebook group in a Telegram community. A um, whole bunch of people like it. If you want to come and join us in there, you can uh, learn about more cool DeFi projects. The reason we are building this community at Mosendo is because first thing for us is money and payments, but second thing is financial products and services as upsells in the app for us as a revenue stream. So this gives us a community to be able to sandbox and play with things like injective protocol and different, you know, like staked and things like that as a community with our users, uh, we get to play and interview and, and push and pull. So yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that's us. And uh, I'd love to have you in the DeFi Nation group. And um, I'd love to take any questions on Mosendo and what we're building. Yeah. Thank you.